My name is Andy Denson. I am the founder, CEO, content creator of Ladder Production Films, which is based in Cebu City. Wait, hold on. Is my camera okay? Because <laughs> I tried to put it on. So Delilah and I are volunteers for an organization. We are both based in Cebu. We are both pro-black. We are both anti-oppression, we are both intersectional feminists, and uh, we're both doing work to uh, learn more and more about those topics and have a conversation. We'll be discussing being black and brown in the Philippines, and it's uh, and the context of being black and brown here is connected to Black Lives Matter. It's connected to a lot of things in terms of like the pride movement that's, or the pride month celebration that's happening. It's all tied to, it's all tied together with Filipino. My mother's Filipino, Filipino, but I am, I'm always going to be considered a black man first. Especially because um, people are so exposed to global issues through the internet and social media. What I see is that a number of um, Filipinos locally, you know, locally, mm -hmm. they're trying to say like, oh, it's not our issue, it's not our struggle, we shouldn't like talk about it or whatever. And um, what, I, what I think about that is, sure, it's okay to say, oh, you know what, maybe we shouldn't talk about it if we don't know enough about it. But we should also like highlight it in order to raise awareness because it's not like racism doesn't exist in the Philippines, right. you know. It's and it's not like and it's not like racism isn't a global thing. It is. So I think the disconnect is that a lot of Filipino people just don't have access to the information and resources to tap into the information about the topic and that's why they retreat and say like oh it's not a problem but also it's very it's very telling of how um anti-blackness has been deeply institutionalized into brown communities what's this there's certain prejudice if we hang out with like black people we we definitely discriminate against black people or anyone closer to um, having a black skin, which is, you know, again, the anti-blackness and the colorism that is very prevalent in Filipino society. I don't like to say Filipino culture because I firmly believe that Filipino culture is not what people think it is. It's not about discrimination. It's not about all that stuff. It is just how Filipino society is molded due to the intense colonialism that happened. So Absolutely. there's that right here. Um, and, and this is colorism too. So for example, if you watch Filipino soaps, Filipino, um, yeah, Filipino soaps or Filipino TV shows, the darker your skin is, you're most likely to portray the, um, the maid or the token, token, I don't know, dark person friend, like where basically you're like the one who gives good advices and all that, like that's or what you portray. Yeah. yeah, exactly, or the butt of the joke. So, so that's how, um, and, and this isn't just, this isn't just, you know, for like dark skinned Filipinos, this is also against um, those people who are indigenous. There are a number of um, indigenous Filipino actors who always get portrayed as like, you know, the funny or the awkward or the um, sad and like the one that really needs help. And basically, yeah, they, that's always that's always how how they are portrayed. Whereas if you're a, a mestiza or basically a really light skin, like you almost could pass as a white person Filipino, you always get the uh, victim role you know like oh like whoa it's me i'm the i'm the what's this i'm the i'm the protagonist but i'm struggling yeah, the excuse me i'm struggling the damsel yeah the damsel in distress and and it's it's it it when people see that it shapes and it molds how they perceive people of that skin color like oh you know what actually you know the bad people are those with like 
darker skin or like the the unfortunate people the victims are like the lighter skin and the struggling ones and it's mm-hmm. it's very it's a very patterned thing like it's almost if you watch every single mm-hmm. filipino soaps it's always like that yeah it, it is like the conditioning of how people perceive other people based on their skin color yeah and a lot of that has to do and a lot of that has to do in my opinion is how western media multimedia not news but western multimedia portrays their you know white people and black people in the movies that they um cast them in and mm-hmm. obviously here in the east or especially here in the philippines that's what we look up to right like that's how we like for example if you're a filmmaker right people are like oh you know what like if you want to be a successful you should make like hollywood esque um action, type of action, type of <laughs> type of yeah yeah and that's how that's how that's how you know that the measurement of of greatness or goodness in the quality of product or in the quality of output you make isn't is based on what the west or you know white people think as like mm-hmm. up to the here standard. and so that's yeah. why yeah exactly. so the standard yeah. the standard is basically super white super like all that and that's why you see that happen in um filipino outputs in the arts mm-hmm. in media and I, i i even remember there was this one time where this was a story about an indigenous um person and the story was portrayed by people in literal dark makeup and it's like how is this even happening and this is a like very recent oh, it's not even 5 years ago colorism it's not just an american thing it's not a weird thing that just happens in the us it happens here and we we suffer from it because if you talk to any american guy or any western guy they think that the philippines is a shithole yeah like i have dated my fair share i have dated my fair share of white guys and yeah. all of them say the same thing Filipinas just like you for your money. Filipinas just use you for your money. Filipinas are beggars. Filipinas are like this and that and and that's thing. That that's racism right there. Like yeah. they a lot of us don't understand how how that is racism. But that's because we are so conditioned to think that racism is only when people are violent to you. And I think that you know it cannot be it cannot be stopped. Like the shifting of how people's ideologies are the evolution of people's values it cannot be stopped because right the internet is such an uncontrollable force like sure facebook can censor instagram can shadow ban all those other stuff but because the internet is not like owned by one person or like one governing body it will always find its way to amplify the voices to connect people so i mean there might be not much. i think that it's very telling whatever an organization or a group or a gathering yeah basically an organization masquerades itself as fighting the good fight and when shit gets real retreats back to their um position of privilege because they're afraid of losing that privilege. Mm-hmm. And it's it's very telling and I think that it's it's kind of like an eye opener for people who are part of that organization who thought that the organization or any organization for that matter is really fighting the good fight because part of fighting the good fight is being dissent is resisting and not bowing down to any form of authority that wants to silence people and wants to control people and wants to minimize the voices of people like that is aside from it being a bad thing realizing that a lot of organizations that masquerade themselves as progressives aren't right. really progressives at all and are only progressives for their own benefit for yeah, clout for money for whatever 
Yeah. I fight so hard for my fellow Filipinos and I don't see the same energy from them. Especially Filipino men. Like, I know all men are trash, but yeah. if I find That's a white true. guy talk shit about, if I find a white guy talk shit about Filipino men, I'm I'm at, I'm their first line of defense. Like I'm out there yeah. defending Filipino men. But where's that energy when Filipino women suffer from all the shit that happens? Like when Filipino women suffer from sexism, from racism, from all that stuff. Where's that energy? And especially, it's even harder when you're a dark-skinned Filipina. Like, I'm not even dark, but people, I've heard people call me the N-word. And it's like, yeah. that's crazy. I'm not even black. But also, why would you even say that? One narrative story where, yep. oh, you know what? All black people are like this. All black people are like this. And it's like, it's not that, yeah, they're black, but they're humans too. And humans are very very different from one another very very it's like very, they're very, like yeah. right like we're still individuals like sure i'm filipino and i know a lot of filipinos like sinigang but i don't like sinigang like is my filipino card revoked yeah. like is that how it works for you guys and um, um, yeah. it's so it's a weird yeah, it's so like, tiring um i'm bayan ko and then, oh. uh, but yeah, right? Like, no, but, yeah, kumbaya, but also in the Philippines, like, let's put it in Philippine context. Oh. Do you yeah, think yeah. that people in the people in the 1980s revolution just sang Ang Bayan Ko and then Marco said, oh, you know what? Thank you for all your singing. We're done with the dictatorship. That's not how it happened. So no. when people talk about peaceful protesting, it is super contradictory to how they are enjoying a lot of the rights they have right now from mm. the fucking rioters, from the fucking protesters who yeah. were not peaceful at all. So, Philippine, basically, Filipino identities in the um, discussion of um, in the discussion that talks about the world, you know. Yeah. You don't get to hear, like, for example, like, let's say people talk about, like, a global thing. People don't, like, people don't ask, oh, and what do the Filipinos think about this? Or how are the Filipinos? So yeah. that isolation, that, that isolation, which is also, again, part of racism, again, people of color, especially, again, brown people. Yeah. That is what makes Filipinos think that their issues are only them and that they're not supposed to take part in global issues. Right. And also because we were taught to be nice. That's what Filipino, like, if you ask anyone nice around the world, sometimes. what nice are Filipinos, right? <laughs> exactly. What, nice what, like, you sometimes. ask anyone. Exactly, yeah, right? And if you ask anyone. If you ask anyone, what do you think about Filipinos? Everyone's like, oh, they're so nice. And and, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that's the thing. People expect us to be nice. And because we don't want to, like, <clears throat> we don't want to change how people see us because we think being nice is good, we keep being nice. And when we do that in a world that has a standard based on European Eurocentric standards, it is very, what's this? It's very self-harming to do that yeah. because at least white people have the actual privilege. We guys just wish we do. Mm. When you do that, when you try to align yourself to white supremacy and you're not white, you mm -hmm. will end up hurting your own people and not gaining anything from it. Maybe white people will think, oh, you're not like those other brown people. But at the end of the day, they will token, see you. It's tokenism. Yeah, but at the end of the day, they it's will token. still see you for what color you are. You can't hide that, you know? You can't be like, oh, you know, like, I'm not Filipino. Because at the end of the day, your skin color will show. And they will still the treat teachers. you the way they treat people not like them. And, and what happens is 
you end up hating yourself. You end up hating your culture. You end up being lost. It's about privilege. That it's not a one thing. It's like mm -hmm. it varies in different degrees. Yep. Like, yeah. So basically, I think that is what's happening here in the Philippines because we may be oppressed, but we're not like 100% oppressed. There's a disconnect right. in trying to relate to people who are 100% oppressed because we still think it's not happening to me. And, and because people continuously say, oh, it's not happening to me, it maybe doesn't exist. Like mm -hmm. the, blind, the privilege blinds people. And I think that's why there isn't enough Filipinos who talk about it. But the beauty of the internet, again, the, the beauty, be again, the basically. But the beauty of the internet is that so many people are getting connected. Um, I remember the Filipina and black, you know that girl who was a singer? I keep forgetting her name. She's Filipina uh, and she's black. And her? she talks about it. Yeah, yeah, her. Uh, and her. she talks about her. it and... And I think that that's very important. Yeah. And there's also the Filipina beauty, the Filipina beauty queen in Cebu, who is black and Filipino as well. She talks about it. And I think that because of those conversations happening, April? Understanding of colorism is... Uh, it's a higher it's a hierarchy of skin tone the lighter you are the whiter you are the more smarter you are and vice for, or, and on the opposite end of the spectrum the browner and blacker you are the less value you have within the culture or within the area man basically colorism colorism stems from racism so colorism happens within non-white communities, non-white mm. countries, yeah, basically non-white communities, wherein your skin tone, you know, not, not your race, because you experience it from the people of your same race. So it's yeah. basically prejudice against your skin tone, stereotypes against your skin tone, which is directed mostly towards people with darker skin tones. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think um, if people should Google this later, but if they type in, in terms of media, if you type in Filipino actor, Filipino actress, uh, you see like a homogenized like grouping, like a grid of actors' headshots. And on a surface level, if you're not critically thinking about it and you're just a casual person here, you might just be like, oh, I know some of those actors. Those are some actors I like and they play parts that I like. But they, there's something that's inherently flawed. It's that they're, it's homogenized and it doesn't actually depict a proper representation. As it, it, it does show that um, most of the results when you search for Filipino actors and Filipino actresses, Filipino performers in general, you will typically get to see lighter skinned or even white skinned um, Filipinos, which are basically the most well-known actors and actresses in, in and around the Philippines. Whereas mm. the darker ones, they don't get the same recognition, even though a lot of them have been in the industry for much longer or even as long as those who are lighter in their skin color. Presentation concerning um, black people in the in, in the global media and yeah. There's also a lack of representation in um, non-black pe people of color countries when it comes to darker skinned um, performers, darker skinned cast. There is, there is a very um, prevalent lack 
of representation. People who are fair skinned or who have been in blockbusters in the past or or have Mm -hmm. more notoriety that they bring in more capital. They bring in more box office or, and it's like, it's weird because it creates like this weird chain effect, uh, like a weird chain effect of um, only hiring lighter skin and not acknowledging other communities that are darker and their, their stories because of money yet still profiting off of the darker skinned people and marginalized people within those. Uh, and, and that's because, and that's because a lot of um, corporations basically are trying to, um, their market is very, um, very uh, centered towards white audiences and white mm. customer. So that's, that's how I see it. And there have been numerous um, reports and even studies that that's the reason why people hire white people to represent their companies. And it's, it does, it happens in so many Asian countries. It happens in other um, non-white countries as well. So it's trying to cater to um, white customers and white um, consumers. So that's why a lot of what you see here in the Philippines is most of the prominent actors, most of the prominent um, business persons are typically lighter skin than, you know, than your regular Filipino who... Media is so important. I think a lot of times we underestimate the value of entertainment or how much entertainment influences us. Um, I I have a strong feeling, and just through my own observations living here, that many people don't experience uh, Black culture or have a good understanding of it due to the centering of whiteness within media like any time that black people black people are seen by um filipinos you know is typically when they're watching hollywood movies and let's just be honest no matter how progressive hollywood likes to think it is they Mm -hmm. still cast black actors with a certain stereotype and And even in the music industry as well, that's the only time that Filipinos see black people. So they always associate black people with what those content projects them to be, yeah, basically. Mm -hmm. What is taught in schools in terms of U.S. history? And like, because I'm curious to understand why people like on the GC from our volunteer organization would be so upset over rioting and protesting and then uh, and i'm just curious about the history like what is taught here in the schools for history okay so i went to public school yeah i went to public school so i'm very familiar with the educational system here in the philippines and frankly there is no conversations about slavery there is none There is none. And um, in the context of colonialism here in the Philippines, it's more like not colonialism per se, but it's more on, oh, you know what? The white people brought us Christianity. So instead of the narrative that's being pushed is that white people gave us Christianity instead of white people colonized us and erased our culture. And yeah. and you can even and you can even see it because when you get to the part, uh, when you get to the part in the lesson, in the lecture where it talks about the um, freedom fighters in the 1800s and the early 1900s, and mm-hmm. down to how the um, independence of the Philippines, it has never been honest, not a hundred percent. Yeah. There is talk. About, there is talks about the sets, but it doesn't go deep into how protests 
and riots and like the the, the uh, extreme war that was raging on in the Philippines against the colo the colonizers. So it's yeah. not it's not spoken as brutally honest as it should be. Mm. And so that how children don't really get to learn about the history of the Philippines and even the history the history of the world. Mm -hmm. I mean and but the funny thing is that we are taught about the Holocaust. Like we know so much about the Holocaust. And <laughs> yeah, right? So um yeah, we were taught about like the Holocaust, we were taught about like Adolf Hitler, we were taught about that. But there wasn't enough information to discuss about how the U.S. like t made black people into slaves. How the Spaniards achieved um, three hundred thirty-three. They just throw like honestly, they just throw that shit like so casual. Like, oh yeah, the Spaniards colonized the Philippines for three hundred thirty-three years, and mm. it's just like so casual. It's like so casual. Like I'm just gonna drop that bomb and. Like there's not even there's not even a discussion of what happened during those three hundred and thirty three years. And the what about prior? Being, yeah. And also, I was wondering about like pre colonization. Is, is anything talked about with, in terms of like datus and kingdoms? And like, there is, good. there is, yeah, there is, there is, yes, there is. There's. Um, discussions about um, the three ancestors of Filipinos, the Malays, the Indos, and the Negritos, which is basically black people who traveled to Southeast Asia and started their own family. And, and there is a conversation, but the conversation is more like, oh, it's just like random information. It's not taken right. seriously. Yeah, it's not taken seriously. And then the narrative that's being pushed when you reach the point of um, colonialism in the lecture, the narrative that's mm -hmm. being pushed is that the white people that came here um, provided education, the white people that came here provided religion, the white people that came here provided democracy. It's, it's almost as if the history is being whitewashed and yeah. trying to make it... Yeah, basically, right? And trying to make it look like white people came here and did good. Right, not which is not conversation. Cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, after the uh, the from after from 1521 to 1898, Americans Americans colonized, the British colonized, and Americans colonized, and then independence was gained. I think Independence Day is coming up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> um. Yeah, I think it's just really it's not interesting even how June twelfth. I don't know if it's just because I don't go out enough, but I'm pretty sure that June twelfth is not even such a big thing. The biggest thing here is Christmas. <laughs> yeah, and Cebu here for Cebu. Oh, Sinolog, actually, right? Like just. Yeah how the Catholic Church still plays a role in uh, kind of pulling the puppet strings in terms of fi having the power and finance and colonization backing it to kind of keep the people, in a sense, docile and one sensing Jesus or white people as a savior, even if it's not spoken on a subconscious level with the religion, the religious icon iconography with the statues, with the Magellan's cross. And I just, I'm wondering if there's any acknowledgement of that and any kind of like, I mean, there isn't, I think from what my, Experience. I've only been in, this, in Cebu for one year now, and I have experienced no sort of critically engaged dialogue about the Catholic Church and how there's a rec and there's a known history of its oppression, especially in the Philippines, since it's a Roman Catholic empire, the only Cath Christian or Catholic empire within Asia, and it's not ever criticized it is, or talked about. It is it true. Is. It is true because it's deeply embedded 
into um, Filipino society so much as that it's actually considered Filipino culture to be Catholic now. Like, mm. if you're Filipino, immediately people assume you're Catholic because that's how deeply embedded religion, particularly um, Catholicism, is in mm. Filipino society. And, and you are right. There is no acknowledgement and there is no... Um, there's very few um, discussions that I've seen and like it's it's been disheartening that the country that you love is being bastardized by so much internalized oppression and it's almost as if the country that you are from the country that you're born in the country that your ancestors are from doesn't even feel like it exists anymore because it's being right. completely wiped out and being completely change into something that doesn't really benefit your country at all. It becomes kind of like a corporate factory or like mm -hmm. an annex of the white supremacist capitalist society of America and just following that model. But, uh, but Pinoy style, Pinoy edition, Big Brother, 1984. Pinoy. I was going to talk about Pride Month as well. And just both of our experiences within the working within the community and kind of the stagnation for me that I, I kind of feel from the organization we're part of in terms of not really being progressive enough to understand how stuck we are in a lot of ways because of, because of the lack of conversation in the silence. That is true. And part of that is again, the lack of um, historical context. Mm. And again, the erasure, the erasure of um, the activism that happened in order to result into the movement, in order to result into the strides that we've made for change. And it's, right. it's also another, another, I know people say stop making it about race, but everything is. And yeah, it's, it's all also connected. Proof, right. It's also proof. It's also proof that um, there is a very, very obvious whitewashing when it comes to historical context of movements because yeah. people don't know enough about the... Uh, if you talk no. about pride, you ask anyone. Yeah, they don't know the history of it. And they immediately go into, oh, you know, like pride is just like, a, like an American thing, like a white people thing. And that's not true. No. Not true. But that's... Yeah. That's how that's how they see it. Like they're every everything about history is super whitewashed and is super catered to not offend white people. And right. that's that's why it's like that. Like that's why there is a lack of um understanding from right. people. And it's interesting too, it's like the the opinions that a white American has takes precedent over your fellow countrymen into the context of pride. Yes, the Stonewall riots, exactly. exactly. It, took, it took property damage to get equal rights. Equal rights, because it's still not equal. There's no such thing currently as equal rights anywhere in the world. Um, but equal marriage rights, uh, marriage rights for the LGBTQIA plus community. And it started with property damage and throwing the brick into Stonewall, Stonewall Inn. And for me, as a Filipino, it's, it felt disheartening to talk about that with other people of the same community and that mm -hmm. happened to be LGBTQIA+, and, not acknowledge, and they wouldn't acknowledge that the property damage going on currently is doesn't matter as opposed to someone's life and human rights. It's not a civil rights movement. It's a human rights movement. And it's that failure to acknowledge that will keep the rights here for LGBTQIA plus stagnant. Like if you ask people about gay marriage here, I don't think it's people are not optimistic about it or don't even think it's a thing that can happen. Like people don't see that as a possibility. People, people, people think that asking for gay marriage in the Philippines is too much. And that's crazy because that's not that's the bare minimum. Like allowing people to marry 
who they love is very minimum. Like it's not too much to ask for your freedom, for your rights as a human being to be able to love who you want to love, mm. to be able to be yourself. And I think that, yeah, you're right. That that is exactly going back to the topic of how the Catholic Church has its influence, and, and which is exactly the reason why. It's hard to、um, gain any progressive footing here in the Philippines. Is it's because the Philippines remains one of the very, very few countries where, no matter how it says that there's a separation of the church and the state, it almost、mm-hmm. seems like we live in a theocracy instead of a democracy. It is a theocracy. I feel like even though it's it's never said out loud or directly、mm-hmm. or. Maybe- It's it is that that is the case, and you're yeah I hundred percent agree and piggybacking off of that I just think it I just I'm wondering if there's gonna be sort of what's gonna be like the push for like marginalized groups here to really see like the progression and the like kind of writing or whatever in the discourse conversations etc taking place. Abroad, not only in the states, to actually do that for ourselves. So I'm I'm gonna answer one of the questions from the comments, and the person's、mm-hmm. asking if homosexuality is illegal here. It's not,、right. but I feel like there's a difference between being punished by the police and being punished by society as a whole. Like you don't need it to be illegal for people to.、Um, Stigmatized, like you can be yeah, exactly. You can be punished by the whole community for being gay. You won't be arrested for being gay, but your whole community can disown you. Your whole community can shame you, which almost is kind of the same as it being illegal. And about how the Catholic Church has so much influence, because that is how most of, for example, the Philippine educational system. Um, when you talk about sex ed, the Catholic Church halts any strides towards that、um, gay marriage or、um, the Soji Bill. The Catholic Church always halts that, and and that's where a lot of the、um, lack of information that Filipinos have is because the Catholic Church, weirdly enough. Has a say in almost all the laws concerning、um, so- social culture, if it gets passed or if it shouldn't get passed, and it's it's not because they have the authority to say it, but because of how many followers they have and the influence、right. of those followers into legislation. Yeah, so it seems like there has to be more. Talk about the church in a critical way.、Um, I I want to just bring up a movie. It's not related. I mean, it's related to this topic. It's called Spotlight from 2015, and it's about a group of Boston Globe investigative journalists uncovering all of the sex sexual harassment cases, allegations, and、uh, convictions that the Catholic priests were having within Boston. What happened within the film, though, is like it didn't stop there. Like once they started doing research on、um, and finding out all of the cases that were like transferred, so the priest could go to a different church or work in a different, go to a different parish or area, they they were able to be absolved of their sins and not be excommunicated from the Catholic Church. But in the movie, it goes further, and it calls out, and it finds out that every single archdiocese connected all the way to the top to the Vatican cover up have been covering up cases for centuries of child molestation and rape, and still building over groups of. There, there needs to be. I agree with you that there needs to be a conversation where we hold accountable.、Um, Organizations and people in power when they、yeah. commit such a heinous act, and and I think that we cannot have progress here in the Philippines and ultimately around the world if we do not see、um, organized religion, mainly Christianity and Catholic Christianity Catholicism, 
mm-hmm. any religion that thinks Jesus is white, <laughs> yeah. there can be no progress or liberation from white supremacy until until we see these organizations, whether they exploit spirituality or religiosity, or as money. tools, or- yeah, as tools, as tools of white supremacy. They are. They yeah. they they help really. create and push the narrative of white supremacy. They help create yeah. and push the narrative of um, gender inequality and so much inequality and oppression while masquerading as a kind and loving and peaceful and caring and concerned um, group of people, even though their beliefs actually harm those that they pretend to be concerned of. Yeah, it's, I agree with a hundred percent. And I think the acknowledgement of just like the white Jesus image is a good step forward. But I think that's so hard. And I think that is like something that I don't even know. I don't know what is going to happen in the future, but I'm like, it seems like it would be like a massive undertaking to explain to the people who are practicing Catholicism or Christianity, the real image of Jesus and the re- and praying to somebody who is a white man and it's not Jesus, that's not Jesus, and praying to that is subconsciously making you think that white is better and white is holy. It's a subconscious, like it's a, um, there's a, a psychological term that I cannot remember right now off the top of my head, but I told my mom this all the time. She's a uh, relig- she's super Catholic small savannah woman and i tell her this all the time and she's like there even with her i can't i cannot budge that (laughs) so so yeah you you are right and i think um yeah it does subconsciously when you are praying to a deity that is depicted as a certain race as a certain Mm. like person of a certain skin color it instills in your mind that any other person that looks like this or is close to this is far more superior than others. True. Instead of instead of like realizing that if there was such a um, powerful um, being, that that being should not be assigned a gender, should not be assigned a skin color. Because once we do that, we either... Um, intentionally or an unintentionally but i still think that it's intentional to align a, such a powerful such a powerful being with whiteness yeah yeah and i think that is a reason or it is a, it's a tactic and tool from people in power to continuously oppress even though on the surface level it's just like it just looks like praying and it looks just like giving your tithes and doing your church thingies. But there's so much critical thinking that's not going on because it's just like, it's happening. Um, what's this? It, it actively, um, encourages people to not ask the questions because the Bible is always right. It will never change. It's always right. So it prohibits, um, critical thinking. You are right. And it also encourages that, True. Suffering. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Angels, white, demons, black. The, even the portrayal. So, and aside from that, you can even see in the Bible some of the scriptures actively, um, actively promotes suffering, almost as if the more you suffer, the more you are closer to God. It is. Yeah. It is basically manipulation basically it's manipulating people that suffering is okay because one day this will end and i will be saved and it's almost abusive. the bible and contextualizing like the suffering like with the book of job the suffering that he experiences is his own and it's not saying that the people reading that should be feeling that same suffering that like the church should be a resource for people who are suffering and like giving financial i mean the churches have contributed to organizations that they feel will save face and make them look good in pr 
but they're not doing an active role and and elim- they have the the Vatican and the Catholic Church as a whole has the money and the resources to house everybody who's homeless, do all the good deeds that is talked about in the Bible with their money, but they choose to like give pe- bits and pieces to organizations and then like like give it a big like stamp of approval and everybody's just like, Ooh, uh, this is, this is exactly. so good. So- exactly. They, they pray more than they give more. Like they yeah. pray more than they give. So, and, and, and going off on that, you are right. That um, they're not doing enough and they're just trying to save face and all this and that. And also, Part of part of what needs to be said about um, this whole um, this whole discussion about religion is that people need to know where it originated because mm. if they don't know, there can't be no um, critical thinking about why is it like this. Like if 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 you talk like you just talked about um, Job, right? People are so focused. People are so focused on the fact that he suffered, and because he endured it, he got rewarded. But no one is mm. asking why a god allowed him to suffer or play games with his life. Yeah, like no one's asking that, and and that's because that's because there's a lack of critical thinking. Because again, religion, especially the organized ones actively promote that the Bible is, you know, perfect. There's no way it's wrong. Like God is perfect and all this and that. And, and, and in that um, narrative, people are um, made to believe that everything that they are taught cannot be questioned. Everything that they are taught is right. Speak out against it or to question it, you're seen as a pariah or um, like an trying to be with it maker yeah antichrist anything like that when and it just like also contradicts like the bible too to like yeah god works in mysterious ways that is (laughs) it it completely it completely feigns accountability um for example if you do something bad the devil made me do it and if something good happens and if something good happens oh you know god is so great but if a kid has yeah. cancer, it's like that's God's plan, and it's it removes all the accountability because right. you to you get to blame something or someone that cannot defend themselves or cannot address themselves. You like if I Is, say that, yeah. Do you think that's the continued mentality or like the current state of twenty twenty with people here, like in the Philippines? A- yes. Yeah. Yes. Do you think yes, it's here in at all? I think that it can only and um well actually I don't like to say this because I feel like it's kind of contradict it kind it's kind of contradictory to what I believe in, but mm. I understand why um when I Hopefully, I'm not going to get red tagged by the government for saying this, but I understand why a lot of Filipinos like to follow our current president because he per- he what's this um he parades himself as against the Catholic Church, and I know that deep down a lot of Filipinos do not like the Catholic Church. Right. Even yeah. Right. Jose so I know. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So. So I know that a lot of Filipinos dislike the Catholic Church, and there's this guy who is against the Catholic Church, and to them, that's good enough. They're not keeping in check of him and what he does as long as he's against the Catholic Church. And and I think that it it's also very um, telling of how naive a lot of Filipinos are due to the conditioning they are taught that if one person says this, this person can never be wrong because that's what religion has told them. Yeah. I was wondering too. I mean, we'll all connect this back to black lives matter where, mm-hmm. but we're focused, but we're just going into the trenches within 
being black and brown in the Philippines to anybody who's joined us or anybody who's going to watch this later. And I really wanted to discuss that too, about the government and the corruption that goes on within the government and the misinformation about, for me, for example, when I learned about Ferdinand Marcos in America, I was taught that he was an evil dictator person. And then coming to, he is, though. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean all the presidents record. are. Yeah, all just, presidents for the record, are. just for the record, for any Filipino that watches this, for the record, I, I am so against the rewriting of history that Marcos is a hero. He is not. And he will never be a hero. And I will never allow anyone say that he is. Like, no. No president is a hero. Because they continue to use their wealth and their power for ge generational wealth to promote only their family and benefit family. Like the Marcos, the Kinos, the mm -hmm. Duterte. All are using generational wealth and power and the Catholic Church to continue to oppress people. I mean, it's one, like it's probably a third of the uh, control going on within our country. But I think that people thinking a leader, a political leader is ever in the self interest of others is a, a false, it's a false, it's a falsehood. True. It's all about self interest of the political candidate or the person in power. It's never about the interest of the people. True. Well, we're, if we're talking about Jesus, then yeah. But if we're talking about a president, then no, they're not. They're yeah, because not. even 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 Jesus was not a political person. He was, right. and frankly, again, this is going to annoy a lot of Christians. Jesus is not the nice guy that you think. He's a badass. That dude flips tables. He's not messing around. <laughs> and he, he up, is. He he spoke he's up against. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, he's an activist. That's what he is. So exactly. he's not a nice guy. He's not a nice guy. He's not a savior or whatever. He is just a person who has an ideology that people should be treated equally, that people should be loved equally, and that people should right. enjoy the world equally. And it's been co-opted by white people, basically. And let's just say that out loud. That's what's happened. Yeah. 100% on God, period. Like, <laughs> they, there's so much fuckery happening. And it's really good that I'm glad a lot of people within the past few days have been really, like, having their own sort of awakenings to it and, like, in a more, like, a, a deeper level. Because I'll just share a little uh, anecdote. Um, since Black Lives Matter kind of, took to the forefront again it's not it's not trending it's always it's been around since trayvon martin and then there's always been human rights and civil rights activism for marginalized people black brown lgbtqi but currently i'm noticing like a spike in like my american friends hello mm -hmm. to all my american friends. we'll watch this later of uh, their guilt like they're feeling their they're feeling guilt and they're feeling like they're being they're acknowledging their privilege and it's it's something that's so, it's so, it's really fascinating because I don't think that can happen here in the same way where it's like really cut and dry between like black, white in America and like there's so many divisions and so like easily divided. And, um, sorry, this is a tangent. Back to my white friends and allies and former white friends. I think it's just like a really profound time that they're actually engaged in all of like the racial discourse and racism that's going on that they've never as done they, before even though we've always should. talked about it. <laughs> as they should i feel like yeah i feel like i'm not okay look i'm not black i have like black friends i'm not black for the record but i feel like it's tiring it's it's tiring for you guys to keep educating white people. It's like, it shouldn't be, I can't breathe. It should be, let me breathe. <laughs> like, give me a break. Like, why don't you guys, since you're so much uh, preaching about like allyhood and allyship and all that, 
why don't you do us the honors of showing your allyship and lead the fucking like way because we're tired like yeah brown and black people, people are tired like Many people, like you've said, what you just said, I've heard a lot of sen the same sentiment, and I agree. Um, someone said, too, like, the, if white people are so quick to bring rifles to capitals over not having a haircut or not this and that, and, they, and they're too scared now to do the same type of thing when it comes to Black Lives Matter, it really shows where people's priorities are. Like, you right. want to get a haircut? Do you want to liberate people <laughs> and make like legislative government change? But it's still an ongoing thing. Like I think this, the protests will probably continue for maybe a couple of more days. Um, I think the allyship is good. I've noticed that. I mean, I, with my black friends back home, the black men and women that I know and I love so much. I'm just really hoping for their safety and most importantly, their mental health. It's over. This isn't just going to be like a fire that, you know, stops burning. I want this moment to ignite all the fires in the world and cause a really, um, be a catalyst of like global and total change for how we want the new world to be because you know we've been talking about um we've been talking about how how the coronavirus let's not forget she still exists mrs rona is still out here raking up and um everyone's talking about the new normal everyone's talking about how the world will be and i feel like part of the new world is you know making it or change it, well, actually, you know what, no, making it into a better place for everyone. So I, mm. I really wish, I'm really hoping, and I think I'm seeing it now that um, this um, protest and um, revolution, actually, let's just call it that, it yeah. is revolution. Yeah. So this revolution is stoking the fires of a global, um, global call to change the world Totally. We're at 26 seconds now. We have to wrap up. Right. Any closing words? 22, uh, close, 21. Close. It's just, you know, Black Lives Matter. That's it. That's all there is to say. Black and yeah. Black Lives Matter. Yeah. And we have pride in that. It's our Pride Month. So we have 10 mm -hmm. seconds. I, yeah. Thank you so much for joining me, Delilah. We're going to do more of these. Thank you yeah. so much for joining the live. Yeah. Closing remarks. It's not all lives until it includes Black people. That's it. Yeah.